Okay, animators, today we are gonna be doing bouncing balls. Now with bouncing balls, there's three things that we wanna be paying attention to. You've got timing and spacing, you've got arcs, and you've got squash and stretch. So those three things we're gonna be aware of throughout this whole process. Now with any animation project, the first thing that we wanna start with is real world observation. So different balls have different material properties. They act differently based on how bouncy they are, how much air is in them, what they're made of, what the surface is that they're bouncing on, um, what the environmental conditions are, like if there's wind. So throwing a bunch of different types of balls can get you a good sense of how the physics work. So if you can get a good estimate of the time between each hit, and you know the frame rate that you're working at, then you can very easily calculate the number of frames that your animation is going to need. And you'll notice that where the ball hits the ground and when it hits the ground is going to be different depending on each ball that you throw. The second thing you want to take note of is what path is the ball following as it bounces through the air, right? It's going to be following an arc, but what does that arc look like? How high is it? how much height does the ball lose with each bounce? Every time the ball hits something, it's losing energy. And so as it loses energy throughout the course of various bounces, the shape of the arc and the distance that it travels is going to change. And of course, different balls are going to have different shaped arcs based on their own individual properties. So once you have a general sense of the timing, as in like when the ball is gonna hit the ground each time, and you have the shape of the arc, then you can divide up that space along the arc into the individual positions that your drawings need to be at. So here, each little tick mark indicates a place where we need to put a drawing. One thing to note when it comes to timing and spacing, a ball has both horizontal momentum that is the momentum that is pushing it forward, either from being thrown or rolling off a table. And it also has vertical momentum that is making it go up and down. Now, if you note from your observations, the horizontal momentum doesn't really degrade very much as the ball moves along, right? So you can look at our rubber ball again and the spacing horizontally is pretty consistent from frame to frame. However, that's very different than the vertical momentum. If you track out the vertical momentum of the ball moving up and down, you'll notice that the spacing is significantly different from frame to frame. And this is due to gravity. So if you recall from Physics 101, when something's falling, it is constantly accelerating, right? This is gravitational acceleration, 9.81 meters per second squared. Don't worry, you don't have to do any crazy calculations. You can sort of just eyeball it, but the important thing is that as the ball drops until it gets to the ground, it is going farther every single frame, right? Because it is starting to go faster and faster and faster. The same thing happens on the way back up. The spacing as the ball moves towards the top of the arc is going to vertically get shorter and shorter and shorter as it slows to that top point, right? Gravity is trying to bring it back down to the earth. So once you have all of this planning done, then your animation becomes pretty easy. You don't have to think about it so much. All you do is use this guide underneath your animation and you can draw the ball moving along the arc at each individual point. One thing you might wanna try during your observation is throwing the ball at different angles and off different surfaces to see what happens. So you can try throwing the ball upwards against a wall and see what angle it comes off the wall. What if you throw it kind of angled down against the wall and see what happens when it comes off the wall? You can try hitting it right in the corner and see what happens. 
if you have the option to make videos and you can use the slow motion feature, then you can have a lot of fun sort of dissecting how crazy bounces happen. And that also helps a lot when we get into more complicated environments and perspective. Okay, the last thing that we wanna talk about is squash and stretch. So let's return to our little rubber ball. Now squash and stretch is really a matter of forces working on an object to deform it. So when a ball comes in and hits the ground, its momentum is going to squash it between itself and the ground, and that's going to deform its shape. So what you want is you want a nice firm connection with the ground, usually that looks like a pretty solid line. And the important thing is that the volume is not going to change even though you're changing the shape, right? The same amount of air is in the ball. Now you can have just a little bit of squash and stretch or you can really exaggerate it depending on how cartoony you want to get. And that's what's fun about animation. But ultimately the volume is always going to stay the same. What about the stretch part? This is where it gets super interesting. If we go back a frame here, you can see that there's this motion blur happening in the video, right? Where the ball actually looks kind of elongated. And so the stretch part of squash and stretch when it comes to bouncing balls, at least, is actually a representation of motion blur. It's not necessarily that like the ball is being stretched out by the, the air around it, but it's more that the, the speed that it's traveling is causing it to appear elongated. And so you can definitely draw that a variety of ways. Um, again, the volume should probably stay the same, even though it looks like in this motion blur frame, you know, it looks like the volume is like increased, but that is really, you can draw it as motion blur like that. Or if you want to, you can kind of like stretch it out a lot like this. And the last thing to note is that as the ball gets up to the top of its arc right here, it is returned to its original shape, that perfect circle, and that's because it's at that point where no forces are really enacting on it at all, right? It's sort of like weightless. One thing that I do recommend is that on your guide layer where you have your timing and spacing guide, you might also want to put a template for your ball to help you keep the volume the same. And so this is just a drawing of your ball that is at the correct volume when it's in its sort of neutral state. And then what you can do is as you're going along and animating, you can use that template as a reference or even directly trace from it and then move the ball into the position that it needs to be in. And this will help you keep the volume consistent through the squash and stretch because you'll always have that original volume there to refer to. So that's a little pro tip for you, and I hope you enjoy creating your first bouncing balls.